Hi, folks. My name is Carrie Anderson. I'm going to start us off today um, by saying that this is the final um, luncheon for the academic year. We'll start back up in September. And I just want to thank a few folks uh, that have been really instrumental in making sure these happen for us every week. Um, we would not be able to do this without the space on HLS campus, without the support of the HLS media services team, um, without the help of the events and facilities offices, specifically Rian and McCarthy, who does all of our event organizing, um, without the support of Restaurant Associates, um, the team there, uh, including Andrea and Stephanie, have been um, wonderful this year to us, um, and really the entire team at BKC, so our events team, our communications team, and our ITS team. Ellen and our IT team has been here every week. Um, Victoria and Dan, who are on our comms team, and Ruben, who basically manages all of these and puts this together for us every week after week. So just wanted to quickly uh, give them a round of applause for all of the support throughout the year. <laughs> and I'm going to turn this over now to Amr Asher. And there was one more person that we forgot to thank, which was Carrie herself. So thank you, Carrie. Who is totally instrumental in being the um, orchestra leader of all these lunches, interacting with all the guests and all the people that are helping to put that, um, these wonderful talks together. So um, thank you to, the, to all the teams that really uh, do such a wonderful job. Um, and thank you to our guests. And I'm excited today to introduce uh, Christo Wilson, who is a professor of computer science at Northeastern. Um, I think one of the people doing some of the most exciting work in algorithmic studies and probably one of the people building out the field of algorithmic studies. So we, it's a real treat that we have him today. Um, Christo is also the head of the undergraduate bachelor's in computer science for cybersecurity at Northeastern. He um, is involved in, in so many different things, and you're going to hear just one piece of his work uh, related to algorithmic auditing um, today, but there's so much that he's done in terms of personalization, uh, looking at personalization and looking at all the ways that algorithms influence our lives online. Um, Chris, uh, Chris is also involved in Christian Sandvig's lawsuit uh, with the ACLU uh, that is essentially looking at um, and examining the CFAA and challenging uh, the provision in that, in that law that says that breaking the terms of service constitutes a federal crime because as you'll see in today's presentation, doing research and breaking, breaking terms of service, but maybe not necessarily in this uh, instance, but perhaps what we can talk about it, um, is something that's really important to research communities like the Berkman Klein Center and like universities uh, all over the country and all over the world. So it's a really important issue uh, within this own community. Christo is part of that, uh, part of that effort and he's doing some really exciting work there. And I'm gonna hand it over to him now to talk to us about bias in search engines. And I'll, uh, two other things I'll just quickly mention before you start. One, we're being webcast, so please just be aware of that. Uh, two, Christo definitely welcomes questions. Uh, and if you are going to ask a question, please just identify yourself so we can have some context. Great. Thanks. Well, thank you all very, very much for being here. Um, it's an honor to be speaking at Harvard, uh, where Latanya Sweeney arguably sort of invented this idea of algorithm auditing when she looked at racial discrimination in online advertising. Uh, so as Amr said, I'm a computer scientist, um, so take everything I say with a grain of salt. Uh, outside of you know, nitty-gritty technical details, I have no idea what I'm talking about most of the time. Uh, so please, you know, feel free to ask me questions, uh, challenge me in any way. Uh, and at the end, I have some interesting sort of discussion prompts to kick us off. Um, so today I would like to talk about one particular piece of work we did looking at gender bias in online resume search engines, right? This is the kind of search engine that a recruiter would use to go and find potential candidates to bring them in for review, uh, reviewing and possibly hiring. So before we get to that, I'd like to take a few moments to just sort of set the stage. We're increasingly finding that uh, the social and sort of structural biases that exist in society are embedded in the data that's being collected by companies, uh, and by governments, right? And then the unfortunate thing is that that data is then used to build uh, various kinds of systems, right? We can use it to train machine learning algorithms, or we can use it for, for simpler tasks. 
But what that often ends up doing is it takes these social biases and either reflects them or amplifies them, right? You end up with a machine that reflects a social bias, right? And not necessarily, this isn't necessarily intentional on the part of the engineers who built the system, right? It's just a consequence of the fact that the data has a problem and you've used it uncritically in some other context. So increasingly we hear about this sort of thing in the news. Um, you know, academics have been interested in this for, you know, for a long time now, looking at sort of uncritical uses of data. But you also see this in the news. Um, you know, people find examples of systems like predictive policing algorithms, let's say, where you have a, historic, a, a system with a historical bias issue that ends up in the data, and now you have tools being used by police that are reflecting and reinforcing those social biases. So the question that I'm interested in is, how do we actually measure and understand these kinds of systems? Right? It's one thing to say, we think this is bad, right? and engineers should do more, right? they should clean the data, or we, they should train systems that are fair by design, or maybe we need to pass laws or regulations that prohibit these kinds of uses of data. Right? But at the end of the day, we still don't really know what's going on out there in the real world in practice. Right? Algorithms are trade secrets. Companies aren't typically divulging the secrets of what's going on inside these black boxes. Right? Even if you mandated that the source code, let's say, be transparent, that's not enough, right? because you also need the data. Right? The data is what's ultimately driving the system as well, and if we mandate uh, transparency of all data, there's huge privacy implications for that. Yes? Um. I'm Kathy Pham, I'm, I'm a fellow at the Berkman Center. Um, we often hear people talk about the data being the problem, and mm -hmm. it's great to, to have the algorithm up there as well as a goal. But can you share? Can you share from your experience and perspective ways that algorithms reproduce and entrench the biases from the data? Yeah, so there's many sort of uh, examples of this get, that get trotted out during like every one of these conversations. Um, so one is predictive policing. Right? ProPublica has done incredible work looking at the Compass algorithm um, uh, in Broward County, Florida, showing that uh, it was more likely to send African American defendants to jail uh, than uh, white defendants. Um, Latanya Sweeney's work looking at um, racial bias in advertising. Um, so her work showed if you did a search for an African-American name, you were likely to see ads saying, this person may have been cr uh, convicted of a crime, right? Do a background check on them. Yeah. If you just had good data, then there's nothing wrong with the algorithm. It's totally fine. So can you take it a step further in mm -hmm. it from, and, and talk about, well, I guess, more, like, more technical part of why it's the algorithm? Yeah, so I... Frankly, I kind of hate this argument. I mean, some of the machine learning people really like to say that the, the data is the, is the only issue, right? The algorithm itself is sort of neutral and beautiful. And I don't really buy that um, in the sense that someone is making a decision to implement a system, right? And you can imagine using machine learning or not using machine learning, right? There's a variety of tools in the toolbox. And to say that machine learning itself is inherently neutral and it's purely a data issue, ignores kind of the autonomy of the engineer and the design decisions that go into building these systems. Um, this also gets into other issues like how data is being collected and dark patterns. Are you soliciting information from people to then use it against them, essentially? I mean, there's a lot of decision making that goes into every aspect of this, from kind of the upfront user interface to the back end processing of data. Those are all decisions being made by people and implemented in code. So to say, well, it's just a data issue, it, it's too short-sighted, in my opinion. Um, but I'm happy to be challenged on that. Do they offer this algorithm for all high-level jobs? Or Hold on one second. I'm just wondering whether they offer this algorithm for any kind of job or do they stop at low level and medium level? So this, um, I'm going to be focusing on all kinds of jobs, uh, low and high level. So in order to try to understand what these systems are doing, right, there's kind of this emerging field that I like to call algorithm auditing. Right? I consider myself to be an algorithm auditor. 
right? And what that means essentially is that I go and find systems of interest, right? Things where it's high impact, where I believe it impacts many people's lives, and I go and try to figure out how it works, right? So what data is being collected? How is that data being used, right? And ultimately, what is the impact of these systems on people, right? Because that's ultimately what we really care about. So I'm a bit of a reverse engineer. It's sort of a, a simple, straightforward way to think about this. So today in particular, I wanna talk about hiring websites. Um, so you've probably heard of many of these, right? Monster, LinkedIn, Glassdoor, right? These are platforms used by millions of people to find employment, right? So you may have used one of these platforms probably from the perspective of a job seeker, right? You went and created a profile and uploaded a resume and then you could search for open jobs and apply to them, right? But there's another facet to these uh, these tools, right, they're also used by recruiters to do active recruiting, right? They can search the database of all resumes to try and identify potential employees to go reach out to them, right? Say, uh, this is like headhunting, you know, I think you'd be great for this job, come in for an interview. Right, so I would argue these systems are systemically important, right? Millions of people rely on this as a way to find employment, right? And this is a context where we know there's social and historical biases, um, that you know, regulation has tried to, to uh, deal with over the years. Right? So how these systems play into that, I think is very interesting and consequential. So to give you an idea of what the system looks like from a recruiter's perspective, right, it really just looks like a search engine. So here's an example from Indeed. Right? I'm searching for a software engineer located in the New York region. In the left-hand rail, you have your filters, right? How far away, specific skills, you know, years of experience, that kind of thing, to refine the people you're interested in, right? And then you're given a ranked list of people, right? These are people who have created a profile and uploaded, uh, uh, uploaded a resume that match your criteria, right? The same way that you might search for something on Google, right? So this is very interesting, but also sort of troubling to think of this as a people search engine, right? And if you think about Google and how important being number one is in the rank, right? The same logic applies here, right? These people at the top of the ranking are privileged, right? They're the ones who are likely to be seen and headhunted by recruiters, right? So being ranked highly in this system matters, right? It directly impacts your ability to get recruited and find employment. Now, the ranking metric that is used in these systems is opaque, right? It just says we rank them by relevance, right? But nobody really has any idea what that means, right? That's up to the engineers of this company, right? The other thing that you'll notice is that there is essentially no demographic information available here, right? It doesn't say whether these are men or women, if they're black or white, right? And that's intentional. When you sign up for the service, the companies don't ask for that information. They don't want to know your demographics, right? Because at the end of the day, they would like decisions to be made not based on demographics, right? That would be discriminatory. So to the greatest extent possible, they try not to collect that and they try not to show it. So on one hand, this seems good, right? You have a system that's not collecting demographics, not showing demographics, right? And that, seems to, uh, it, it, like it would create a system that is demographically blind, right? It should be neutral to all these different categories, uh, and that should, uh, try, that should do something to help eliminate bias, right? If you're a recruiter and you're looking at this and you can't tell people's demographics, right, then it prohibits me as an individual from uh, bringing up my sort of internal biases, right? You can think of this as sort of like um, a blind audition for an orchestra. Right. Historically, orchestras were incredibly biased. Right? It was primarily men. Right? They instituted uh, a system of blind auditioning, right? where you play behind a curtain. No one can see if you're a man or a woman or black and white. Uh, and this it, uh, had the net effect of dramatically increasing diversity in orchestras. Right? It eliminated demographics from the decision making. Right? But here's the problem. Right? Demographics aren't really gone. They're just sort of buried. Right? Ultimately, there is a ranking algorithm here, and it's looking at things like where did you go to college, right? How many years of experience do you have? What's your current level of seniority in your company? Right? And those are all things that are linked to demographics, right? Different people have different levels of opportunity, right? There are things like glass ceilings, 
right? And all of those systematic biases end up being embedded in the data. Right, so if the ranking algorithm is using those things as features to decide who is relevant, right, who is best, that could in turn just re reflect these social inequities. Right, remember, everyone showing up at the top of the page is privileged. Right, so if the ranking algorithm is taking these things into account right, and systematically moving some people lower, right, that's directly impacting their ability to find employment. Yes. I just had a question about the previous slide. How could it be that with um, the search being software engineer in New York, New York, that you only returned New Jersey, people who were living in New Jersey? So it was a 25 mile radius around New York. But as far as wouldn't it be pr privileging New York, New York as a, as a factor? It should. It's interesting that the top candidates happen to be coming from New Jersey in that case. I'm not exactly sure what that signifies. <laughs> Something about the, the prices of real estate in Manhattan, <laughs> even for software engineers. So this idea that uh, bias can creep into these, these kinds of hiring systems, it's not hypothetical. So at one point we ran a study looking at gig economy services like TaskRabbit. So if you've never used this, it's the kind of service where you can go and search for someone to walk your dog or mow your lawn. Um, so we were interested in whether there were uh, demographic biases on this service, right? And the important thing that our study found is that there were, right? They come from the ratings from the users, right? Users hire these workers to do things and then they can leave feedback. Well, that feedback, it turns out, is biased, right? We found that uh, women and people of color systematically received lower ratings than white men, right? What that ultimately meant was that the search engine produced biased results because it ranked people based on their ratings, right? You have a bunch of people who will walk dogs. Who should be the top person? Well, it's the person with five stars, right? But they failed to consider the fact that the star ratings embed this bias from people generating the data. Right, another case that was in the news, right? Amazon built an AI system to try and screen hiring applicants. Right? And unfortunately, this was trained based on their prior data from hiring, which had a systematic bias in favor of men, uh, specifically male engineers. Right? And lo and behold, they ended up with a system that systematically discriminated against women. Right? So it's not at all hypothetical. Right? A system like this could have a bias. Right? The question is, does it? So in particular for this study, we're gonna be looking at three search engines, Indeed, Monster, and Career Builder, and we're gonna be focusing on gender bias. Right, so are these resume search engines systematically reducing the rank of women or vice versa? Right, is there some kind of gender bias inherent in the ranking algorithm? We're gonna be looking at this from two different perspectives. Right, so it's, these are essentially two different kinds of fairness. Right, first, we're gonna talk about individual fairness, which you can think of as equal opportunity. Right, two people with the same skills, the same qualifications, should essentially be appearing at the same rank, right, once we've ignored gender. Right, same skills means same rank, right, equal opportunity. However, there's another way to conceptualize fairness, which is group fairness. Right, what that means is that overall, right, the average rank of men and women should be the same. Regardless of skills, regardless of qualifications, right, on average, we should all be the same regardless of gender. And you can think of this as roughly being equivalent to disparate impact, right? Is one group systematically different than the other group? If we find that the system isn't fair with respect to gender, then we have a separate question, which is, was this intentional, right? Was the system designed to use gender Right, is there direct discrimination, or is this just an artifact of the data? Right, it's something that's embedded in it, and there's proxies surfacing that is causing this. So I'll go through a little bit of our data collection. Right, how did I get all this data? Um, I'll talk specifically about how we analyzed individual and group fairness. Um, we'll answer the question, was there or was there not direct discrimination going on here? Um, and I'll briefly conclude, and then we can discuss, and you can rip apart my study. Um, any questions so far? Cool. Okay, so this is an algorithm audit, 
which means that my subjects are algorithms. Right? That's a weird thing to say, but that's essentially the framing here. So my subjects are the search engines of Indeed, Monster, and Career Builder, and we chose these because they're extremely popular. Right? As you'll see, we get hundreds of thousands of candidates from these search engines, um, and this is just a subset of the, the cities that they operate in. Right? They have millions of people. Um, we would have liked to do more, like LinkedIn, uh, but LinkedIn is very expensive and very litigious, so we decided not to look at them. Um, so on Monster and Career Builder, the candidate data is not public. You have to sign up as a recruiter, so we did that. Right? You pay a couple hundred dollars and you get access to the recruiter tools. Um, that required some light bending of the truth. Uh, and on Indeed, this is all public. Right? Anyone can go and look at the recruiter tools. There's no gating involved. So with respect to my data needs, essentially what I, what I have to have are search results. Right? Millions and millions of search results so that I can analyze them all to figure out are there systematic differences between men and women who appear in the rankings. So we ran a lot of different queries. So we chose 20 different cities to run queries in. And these were chosen for diversity. Right? We want big cities, we want small cities, we want cities that are demographically representative of the US, we want cities that are majority minority, right? We need diversity here. So in every one of the 20 cities, we ran searches for 35 different job titles. And these were split between high and low skilled positions. So the high skilled jobs are things like software engineers, accountants, uh, registered nurses, right? Things that require accreditation. And the low skilled jobs are things like mail carrier or taxi driver or customer service. Right, things that you could get with, let's say, a high school diploma. Right, and again, we do this for diversity. Right? We want things that require college education, that don't require college education. Right? So we run all these searches on these uh, recruiting tools. Right? What is the actual data that we're getting back from them? Right? So we're getting search results that look like this. So right off the bat, you get things like the candidate's current job title and position, right? So are, are they a software engineer? Are they a senior software engineer? Those kinds of things. You get their experience in education, right? Do they have a college degree, high school degree, a doctorate? Um, and then on Indeed specifically, we also got full resumes, right? So for the people on Indeed, we actually have much, much richer data. Um, unfortunately, we couldn't get that from Monster and Career Builder. So in total, on Indeed and Monster, we had 13 different variables per candidate. And on Career Builder, we only had six. This, you'll see this is sort of a theme. Career Builder is the weakest of the three platforms that we studied. So this is good, but I'm missing one critical thing. Right? This is a study about gender discrimination. Where are my genders coming from? So to, it, what we did is we inferred people's gender based on their name. Right, so fortunately, we're running this in a Western society where first names are heavily gendered. Right, so you can go and get the US baby name data set. Right, so this is the names and genders of everyone born in the United States for the last N years. You can use that to calculate you know, for a given first name, what is the likelihood that it is a man or a woman? Right, is it a male name or a female name? So essentially what we do is we assign a probability of being masculine to every candidate in the search results. Right, so I have three lines here, one for each of the services. I have the probability of masculine on the x-axis with one meaning I'm really, really certain that you're a man, uh, and a zero meaning I'm really, really certain that you're a woman. Right, and you can see that the distribution is essentially bimodal. Right? For most of the candidates, like 45-ish percent, their name is heavily gendered. Right? This is someone with a name like Michelle. Right? It's highly unlikely that this is a man. Right, on the other end of the spectrum, you have someone with a name like Christopher. What's that? Yep, so Chinese names are a huge problem because they're not inherently gendered. Um, so this weird artifact in the center, these are essentially foreign names or names that just never appeared in the US baby name data set. So around 8% of the population, I don't know what their gender is. So that's something to just keep in the back of your mind when I'm running the analysis, right? There's 8% sort of uncertainty here for some of the candidates. Um, but by and large, I'm pretty confident in our labeling here. 
So the summary of the data set is as follows, right? 35 job titles, each queried in 20 different American cities. For each one of those, we collect all of the search results. So this is around 1,000 candidates per search. And this was all collected in 2016. So in total, we had around 500,000 uh, job seekers on Indeed, uh, 260,000 on Monster, and 68,000 on CareerBuilder. So we have tens to hundreds of thousands of individuals to try to put into the models and understand what's going on. So now let's talk, go back to our research questions. Right, first, we're gonna talk about individual fairness. Right? And this is essentially equal opportunity. Right? Do two people with the same qualifications essentially show up at the same rank, regardless of gender? Right, then we'll get into the group fairness. Right? So is this men and women on average have the same rank? Right? Or is there something like disparate impact going on? Right? A systematic difference in men as a group versus women as a group? Right, and then we'll get to the third question, which is, was this intentional? So you already either you have sort of a preview, I must have found something, or I wouldn't even be asking question three. So we'll start with individual fairness. Right, so the idea here, again, is that if you have the same kinds of features, right, the same experience, the same education, the same kind of current job position, you should be showing up at the same rank, right? So to analyze this, we're gonna use regressions. Uh, the dependent variable in my model is gonna be rank, right, because that's what I care about, right? Is the rank between these candidates roughly the same? Right, and to do the modeling, we're gonna use a mixed linear model, right? Without getting into sort of the details, you know, the reason we do this is because as you go across job titles uh, or across cities, right, there are just variances in the skill sets. Like if I'm comparing uh, software engineers in Mobile, Alabama versus software engineers in New York City, right, they're just systematically different, right? They're different locations. So this kind of a model takes that into account, right? It makes the comparisons across jobs and across places more fair. So, okay, so jumping right into what we found, right? We did find a statistically significant difference between the ranks of uh, male candidates and female candidates. Right, so I am confident that what I found is a real effect. But we have to ask ourselves what the effect size is. Right? Just because I found something that's real doesn't mean it is like, actually important in the real world. So what I'm showing you on this graph is the difference in rank, uh, or essentially the, the amount that the ranks increase for male candidates as you go down the list of results. Right, so if we're only considering, let's say, the top 20 candidates that come back in the search results, what is the advantage being conferred to male candidates? Versus, say, if you go down to rank 100, what is the relative advantage being conferred to male candidates? So if we focus on just the top ranks, right, there is an advantage to men, but it's so small that it's almost imperceptible. Right? If we're just talking about like, the top 10 results, Men get a slight advantage, but it's less than one rank. Right? So essentially, it's meaningless. Right? This difference only becomes meaningful when you get deeper and deeper into the results. Right? By the time you get to, let's say, result 50, you know, if there's a man and a woman with the same qualifications, the tie will be broken in favor of the man, and they will get a higher rank. Right? And this continues to grow as you get farther and farther down. Quick question. Um, so did you take into account any differences in kind of proportion of men and women on this list? Because you know, if you had 10% women, then it yep. would be expected that they have lower rank on average. Yep, so we have to. Um, because like for like software engineers, right, it's hugely imbalanced in terms of the population. So this is all normalized to the relative proportions in the population. So this is sort of a mixed bag. Yes, on one hand, my models say that there is a, a systematic advantage being conferred to male candidates here. Right? That sounds like discrimination, but the effect size is very small. Right? So whether this is actually a problem in the real world, we don't know because we don't know how people use this system. Right? Does a recruiter only ever look at the top 10 results? Maybe this doesn't matter. But if recruiters look deeper in the lists, right? they look at 50 people or 100 people, then I would argue this very much matters, and this is something we should take very seriously. 
So this is individual fairness, right? Where we're considering people's qualifications. What if we switch gears a little bit and talk about group fairness, right? So just in general, are men and women treated the same? Right, so for this, all we're looking at is just the distribution of ranks for men and women, and we're comparing them directly. And what we found is that in most cases, the results are group fair. Right? The average rank of men and the average rank of women is the same for most of the job titles that we searched, but not all. There were a couple cases where there were systematic differences, um, and most of these, unfortunately, occurred in engineering fields. Right, so for things like software engineer, mechanical engineer, network engineer, um, somewhere between 8 and 13% of the queries we ran, right, men appeared on average at higher ranks than women, right, even taking into account that women were just a smaller fraction of the population. In all of these cases, the unfairness favored male candidates. We didn't see a single case where they it was unfair in favor of women. So this is pretty concerning, right? I'm a computer scientist, and I cringe when I see this, right? We, we know we have these huge inequities in the tech sector, and it, you just see it like being reflected right back at you by this system. Um, so this is pretty unfortunate, in my opinion. So our final question is, is this intentional or not, right? Does the ranking algorithm use gender as a feature explicitly? Right? Or is this something that's just coming up naturally because of uh, biases embedded in the data? So the way we're going to attest this is through controlled experiments. Right? So we made accounts for job seekers, and we uploaded resumes to see how they would rank. And then we would change their attributes to see if it would change the ranking. Right? So here's a quick example. Right? Let's say that these are the original search results. Right? So that's the top person, that's the bottom person. I upload two resumes from Joe and Bob, and I record their rank, right? This is the order that they appear in. Then I go back and change Bob's name to Amy, right? I essentially flip his gender. What I'm looking to see is, does that cause the ranks to switch? Right? If the algorithm is considering gender, this is what you would expect to happen, right? Because that's the only thing I've changed. All I've done is change their name. So we ran a lot of controlled experiments on a bunch of different variables, right? We tried doing things like changing the length of your resume. We changed how many keywords or skills you had. We changed where you went to school. And the results were sort of all over the place, right? Like on Indeed, none of the tests mattered, right? Nothing impacted the rank. On Monster, uh, two of the tests actually mattered. And so if we changed where you went to school, it did flip the rank. Right? Similarly, if we said I'm currently employed or I'm not currently employed, right, that also flipped the rank. Right? On Career Builder, there were also two features that mattered, whether you were currently employed and how much job churn you had. Right? Have you been in a position for 10 years or you have you had 10 jobs in 10 years? But the most important thing is this top row. Right? When we changed the person's name to change their gender, it didn't impact the rank at all. all right, so what this demonstrates is that the, the algorithms are not trying to infer your gender and re-rank you based on it. So it does not appear that there is direct discrimination here. Right? There's no attempt to determine who you are and then re-rank you based on your demographics. Okay, so just to quickly wrap up, right, there are some serious limitations to this study. Right? We are using inferred gender based on name. Right? That is not the same thing as someone's true gender. Right? So that impacts our analysis. Also, we have a very simplistic view of gender. Right? It's, we're just treating it as binary, which of course is not great. There's questions here about ecological validity. Right? We can get into the details of whether I modeled this correctly. We can also get into arguments about whether these results matter. Right? Do recruiters actually use the tools in the way that I've kind of assumed in my analysis? Right? We don't know because no one's ever studied their behavior. One sort of unsatisfying thing about this work and algorithm auditing in general is that you can't really do a lot of causal explanations here. Right? I showed that there's no direct discrimination based on gender going on, but I don't have a satisfying explanation for you of why there was unfairness. It's there, and it's likely being caused by some kind of, of you know, proxy embedded in the data, but we don't know what or why. 
Um, and then the last thing, you know, we did these controlled experiments, but I can't possibly argue that these are comprehensive, right? We tested seven or eight different variables, but there could be tens or hundreds more that we just haven't thought of. So to conclude, right, I would like to just re-emphasize that we don't see these companies doing anything intentionally discriminatory, right? So don't start filing your lawsuit, right? That said, right, there is individual unfairness here, um, systematically uh, in, in favor of men against female candidates, but the effect size is very small, right? Whether this has any kind of practical impact on the real world is unclear. With respect to group fairness, right, again, we saw problems primarily in technical positions, but this is, again, sort of an emergent characteristic of the data, not an intentional decision to rank people based on demographics. So this is the reason I have the glass half full here, right? This is very much a mixed bag set of results. So I'll stop there. Um, I would love to have a chat about all these things. Um, a couple of interesting questions. You know, so one is, should hiring systems or even just algorithms more broadly do more to combat these kind of pre-existing social biases? Right? If we take it that there's problems with data, is a res responsibility for companies to, to take that into account when they engineer their systems? If so, what kind of fairness should they be going for? Right, there's very elegant results saying that in most cases, you can't have individual and group fairness at the same time. That means you have to make normative choices. Right? Who should make those choices? Another really interesting thing is that in order to make these systems fair, you have to control for demographics. Right? If I know your gender and your race and your religion and your political affiliation and blah, 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 I can control for them and normalize it and build a fair system for you. But that requires people to change their behavior. They have to be willing to tell us those attributes so that we can input them into the system and do the normalization. Are people gonna do that? Right. Would you be willing to give all that sensitive data to a resume search engine or a bank right, under the promise that they're going to use it to make things fair and not just use it to discriminate? Right. But the most part, the main research would be the database for the most part. Not as much as you'd think. We, we tried, so originally this was conceived as both a gender and race study, and the inferring race from name actually was terrible. It was really bad. So it, it, it works in some sort of like obvious verticals, but like African Americans, it, it's, it doesn't really work. Um, so the whole thing was just sort of bankrupt. Yeah. Um, and then there's sort of questions about me, right? I'm an algorithm auditor and I think this is necessary. Right? I think people should be held accountable. I think should, there should be transparency. Um, but there's debates about whether this is a thing. Right. Should I be allowed to do this in violation of someone's terms of service? Right. What gives me the right? So with that, I will shut up. <laughs> Thank you so much, Christo. So just to keep some order here, maybe people can like raise their hands and we've got a couple of different mic runners and we'll, we'll kind of go around the room. Um, and if just raise your hand so that we can uh, keep an eye on you. We've got the mic. Hey, over here. Um, <laughs> quick question. Oh yeah, I'm uh, Momin Malik. I think we've met at ICWSM. It's good to see you. Good to see you too. I'm a fellow here at Berkman Klein. If you didn't control for the base rate, then how much does that affect? So I mean, we're looking at controlling for that, but if we didn't, if we looked at the quote unquote pipeline problem, then how much worse is it? Yeah, so our baseline here is just everything we saw, so like, First, uh, let's say software engineers, right? We look at all the search results for software engineers and we use that to estimate what the true population of software engineers is. Um, but as you said, we have no idea how reflective that is, right? We don't know who uses these services. We don't know what's coming out of the pipeline. Um, so, that, I mean, the short answer is I just don't know. Um, and maybe you can use something like the, you know, uh, ACS data to try and get a better baseline. But I, I really don't know. I mean, we're, we're starting to get into like very narrow sort of, of verticals here. Um, My question is, um, uh, would, how about in your opinion of uh, 
all the work that you've done, uh, would you recommend to a woman to change her name to get an advantage, uh, or at least, well, how about using a, a initials? Is that assumed that that's a, be a woman? And uh, also, presumably, the other way around, mm -hmm. you wouldn't want to have a boy named Sue. <laughs> <laughs> so this, this is a fascinating question. Before I started this work, I had never heard of resume whitening before. But this is very much a thing, right? If you are a person of color, you will do things to make your resume seem more like a white man, right? If you're Muhammad, then you're M something, right? You put your initials. Um, so I guess wh whether you want to do this depends on who is your adversary. Is it the algorithm or is it a human recruiter? So if your adversary is a human recruiter, right, you're worried about uh, human being social biases, then I think whitening or uh, masculifying or whatever you want to call it is probably a viable strategy. Because um, we have a pretty good understanding about the, the social biases of people. With respect to if instead your adversary is the algorithm, the algorithm doesn't really care about your name or those things. Instead, it's looking at things like what college did you go to? So if you went to, let's say, a historically black uh, university, a recruiter might miss that, but the algorithm doesn't. And now it's a question of do you lie about where you went to school, or do you just say, I have a college degree without saying where? It, it's harder to change a lot of those features without like, systematically disadvantaging yourself in other ways. Um, so this is, it's a really complicated question because the way that these, these individual attributes link up to demographics are, are so complex. Getting rid of them entirely, I mean, this is what machines do best. They, they find these patterns. Hi, you to your left, hi. I am Paco and I'm a Harvard alum from like decades ago. Um, very interesting, your project, and I wanted just to say, obviously because it hits me, but more and more people are going to be coming onto the, you know, ranks of the older generations. And if you go in this, if you keep going in this, in this venue, I wanted to ask you, you know, how do you, you, you talk about gender, race, sexual orientation. What about age, right? Yep. I mean, age is such an automatic thing because just years of experience, mm -hmm. year of graduation, and it'll automatically be there. How are you going to preempt? In other words, this is going to be so difficult for, for, for you to avoid this bias against, uh, you know, against us the elder who still want to work. Mm -hmm. Anyway, thank you. So this is an extremely cogent point. Um, there have already been lawsuits against these companies for age discrimination because it's an obvious thing to do ranking on and it's obviously discriminatory. Um, so, I mean, fortunately, because age is intrinsically linked to like years of experience, it's easier to measure and control for. Um, so in that sense, it's, you're a little bit better off because it's a visible attribute. So it's easier to try and, and uh, remove that kind of issue from the data. But then you run headlong into people's expectations of the system. Right? I did this search. I kind of expect the most qualified people to be at the top or whatever. And now I'm explicitly like trying to discount that in a way. And now it's, it's weird. The results I'm getting are not what I expect. Um, so there, you're running headlong into kind of these interface design issues. And like, we don't know how people will react. But I agree. I mean, this is a like, systemic problem. <laughs> got one, two, and then three. So why don't you? Hi. <clears throat> Hi, um, Raj Pargav over at Microsoft Research. Um, I had a question kind of relating to what you mentioned earlier um, about how this is just one step of the process and people interact with technologies in various ways. Um, so for example, something I can imagine here is if I'm a recruiter and I query this, I can just ignore all the female names no matter where mm -hmm. the ranking is. Yep. Um, but obviously, you know, you're very involved in algorithmic auditing and so you think it's valuable. So I guess uh, two questions. One is, what do you think is the value of of doing this from a technical perspective and mm -hmm. what can we gain um, from purely kind of your field and the research you do. And then two is how do you think computer scientists and other people doing this work uh, can work together with anthropologists and other humanists who study how people actually use these technologies and what do you think is the best way for that collaboration and overall? Um, yeah, so with respect to kind of the, the CS stuff, um, I mean, 
part of this work is just about activism and awareness, right? I do this because it's context that people haven't considered. You know, there's decision makers who aren't aware of these issues. I keep hammering on this because I want everyone to, to think about this and start implementing like processes to deal with it. Um, another interesting outcome of this is just metrics for trying to measure things. So actually, I mean, I'll admit that I'm, I was pretty unsatisfied with the methods we used in this study to look at rank. Um, and we've developed now uh, new methods. We just published a paper on for doing much better assessments of like group fairness in these ranked contexts. Those metrics didn't exist before. Um, or I'm thinking of things like you know, the ProPublica Compass data set where like no one had thought about some of these, these axes for, for disparity. And now there's tons of machine learning work that tries to equalize you know, for error rates and things like that. So I think there's, there's a lot to be said for just, you do this, you expose issues, and then that then leads to kind of a virtuous cycle of better algorithms and better tools. Um, so then with respect to anthropologists, um, I mean, th this has to happen, right? I'm, a, I'm an engineer, like a low level engineer by training. This a work just kind of arrived to me, right? I didn't set out to do this, and frankly, I'm, I'm not super well equipped to grapple with, with these, these sociological issues. Um, so working with people outside of computer science is super important. Um, and there, I think there's a huge appetite for it. If, if the CS people are willing to, to speak the language um, and, and move at a little bit of a slower pace, and there's really fruitful collaborations to have, that, that happen there. And I mean, frankly, the, the sociologists and the anthropologists just know more about these issues. Hi, uh, um, I'm Savella and I'm a fellow at the Berkman Klein Center as well. Um, I am wondering on how you selected those categories to test for like university education and mm -hmm. so forth. And I'm wondering, uh, did you get the chance to maybe look at the network request and see like how much time, like what are the variables that they're expecting that Indeed is collecting as you click on the service and scroll down to sort of like get more categories that could be used for determining rank? Yeah, so our, for our controlled tests, uh, the selection of those variables was entirely ad hoc. I and mean, we basically just went through a couple hundred resumes and said, it looks like these are kind of the common denominators. Um, but this was not systematic in any sort of, of way. Um, so with respect to the data they're collecting, um, I don't think that they're doing online learning. So in the sense that like the click data is actively driving the ranking algorithm. So we controlled for that in our tests because we didn't know. So everything was measured in sort of lockstep because um, I didn't want clicks to influence. Um, but that said, I have no idea if they've taken a historical data set of clicks and used that to train the algorithm. You know, just because they're not learning right now doesn't mean that that's not where the bias came from originally. Like you, know, you, you mentioned a recruiter just ignoring the female names. That could easily produce this kind of an outcome. And I don't know, because I don't know what their training data was. Um, but yeah, in terms of the nitty gritty, there wasn't an awful lot of like PII co being collected. There was nothing sort of obvious of like, them trying to infer an attribute about me to then drive like a personalization algorithm. There's none of that. None of these are that sophisticated. I, um, I have a, you made a comment um, earlier that was, that was um, I think, hold your lawsuits. <laughs> they're, they're not, these, these um, algorithms are not intentionally doing anything wrong. So I guess I'm curious what your thoughts on intent or not if your system at the end of the day has a certain result, should they be held accountable? So I absolutely think they should be held accountable. Um, I guess my off the cuff hold your lawsuits argument uh, was more sort of in the vein of like, you could do it, but I think it would be a challenging argument to construct. You know, does, does what we found reach existing thresholds like you know, the 20% rule for uh, disparate impact? I don't think it quite does, but that's just my opinion. Um, and that does not rule out you know, novel legal constructions here. Um, but the other thing is, um, I am absolutely in favor of, of accountability. But I'm also troubled by the, 
I do a lot of accusing, right? I measure someone and I say this is bad, but I don't have a commensurate amount of tools on my side to help people fix things. We're starting to see more of that, but it is a little bit disingenuous, frankly, of me to be like, look at all these issues, and then it's like, okay, well, how do I fix this data when I don't know people's gender? Like, well, actually, I don't know. I don't know how you can fix it. <laughs> um, so there's, there's a lot of, of, of things that have to change to, to really like, eliminate these issues, some of which may be lawsuits. <laughs> This is a question that will probably expose my ignorance. But if I understood what you said in your analysis, there was no conscious gender bias. But it's clear from your data that there is an unconscious gender bias. Mm -hmm. Now, is that what's in the data which you can't get at? That's the background to the algorithm? Yeah, that's the, that's the most likely explanation. In which case, if you can repeatedly demonstrate this, mm -hmm. why can't you make a case for changing the data? So changing the data is complicated. Um, so I mean, one, one avenue for doing that would be changing people's behavior. Right? If the data is just a representation of society, like where people go to school, and who decides to hire men and women for technical roles, let's say. Right? Changing the social processes that ultimately produce this data is super hard. Right? We've been trying to eliminate discrimination from society forever, right? and it's not gone yet. So you know, really like attacking the root of the data generation problem is the equivalent to attacking the root of discrimination in society. Now we can take a, a less ambitious take on it, which is we know that society produces data that has biases, um, but we can just take this pile of numbers and try to fix it. Um, but that requires having more data, right? If I wanna take that pile of data and fix it with respect to gender, I have to know people's genders. Or if I wanna fix it with respect to sexual orientation, right? I have to know people's sexual orientation so I can quantify it and control for it. And I can do that, right? I have the tools, but the question is, are you willing to tell me those things? Right? Will you tell me your sexual orientation or your gender or your race? You know, are you willing to do that in a healthcare context? Are you willing to do that in a banking context? Are you willing to do that in a police you know, enforcement context? Because if you are, then I can fix things. But if you're not, then I'm sort of in a lurch. So fi fixing the data is complicated. You don't seem entirely convinced by my answer. <laughs> Hi. Well, I, I think what you're saying is the data is reflected of societal reality. Yes. And why the hell are you using this as a quote, uh, or, or presenting it as a totally objective mm -hmm. uh, method? And in fact, it isn't as flawed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's a great question uh, for any company that's using data uncritically. Um, you get the sense in Silicon Valley that data is assumed to be neutral, right? And that computation is assumed to be neutral. And it is not, it is inherently unfair. Uh, so if you're choosing to use it, you are choosing to buy into the status quo. Hi. Um I, <clears throat> I, was, I was struck by your comment about whitening the resume as a CV. I think progressive um, corporations are certainly saying, look, we are working within a global economy mm -hmm. and we cannot afford to have everybody in our workforce to be of that same demographic paradigm yep. that has existed for hundreds of years. If we are going to sell and be progressive and to be leaders in our market, we have to recognize diversity and take the algorithm and search for women mm -hmm. and search for persons who are Chinese, Japanese, Asian, African-American, and then deliberately bring them into our workforce 
because they can help us in our analysis of the, the, of the market as well as in our uh, productivity and profitability. Yep. So I, I think that's great. Um, and I applaud any company doing that. Um, so for example, I know LinkedIn has done a lot of work to try and diversify their search results intentionally, right? By, by seizing on exactly what you just said. Um, but there's counterpoints. So for example, on Monster, <laughs> at least when we looked, um, before you uh, pay the money to get a recruiter account, there's like a demo tool. And the demo tool lets you do things like search by diversity. Right? So the, if you're a recruiter, right, you can intentionally do that. But when you actually pay the money and get the real tool, that option isn't there anymore. <laughs> uh, which was very surprising to us. Um, Not, nothing like going public and telling the, um, those who are looking for jobs. <laughs> a monster allows us to bring on diverse employees, but once we become a part of the organization, they no longer give us that opportunity. So I, I just don't think we should have to hide oh. who we are. Because when, yeah. once you walk into that door and they get to see that you're not Todd or that you're not um, <clears throat> W so-and-so last name, yep. the face goes red and yep. thinking, oh my god, what have I brought into my office? So I just think about being up front and being honest with people from the day one. Yeah, no, I, I agree. Um, but I'm also, I am not disadvantaged. So. It, I feel like it's not my place to say what people should or shouldn't do. Um, but I mean, ultimately, I completely agree with you. Right? We can, people can't hide. Right? That doesn't solve anything. Hi, my name's Kate Coyer. I'm an affiliate with the Berkman Klein Center. And I'm ask, actually asking a question for a colleague who saw me on the, the video in the room and <laughs> who's watching remotely. So there's that. Um, but it's, it's related, but it's a, it's a, it's a three-part question, but it's specifically related to the data collection. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, one, as you know, the tech sector is heavily recruiting um, you know, immigrants from different countries, and how do you take that into account when you mm -hmm. can't identify the genders in those names? I know you mentioned the 8% of question mark, but the specific nature of that, if you could address, if you account for that. Yep. And then also, um, in your... Uh, uh, did you collect your ranking data on the same day because of the way companies update the algorithms on a daily basis? How do you control for that? Yep. And then finally, um, how do you take into account the, um, uh, the uh, disproportionate gender in certain fields like computer science and how to, at, versus, say, nursing? And how do you make the comparative analysis there? Thanks. Yeah, so with respect to um, the foreign names that we can't classify, so in the actual paper we ran probably a dozen different models, um, some of which are propensity score matched, right? So we're just looking at the people who can be scored with high confidence in male women pairs, which addresses kind of this issue that like some of the data has more unknowns. Um, and those models look exactly the same as the models with all the data. So it, I think we've addressed that. Um, with respect to the unequal base rates, I think that was question three. So like computer science, right, there's just fewer women. Um, in all those cases, you know, we're, we're normalizing by the population distribution. So for example, in the group fairness case, you know, if there's 80% uh, men and 20% women, that's being taken into account, right? We expect the, the overall distributions of the two to be the same, even though one of the distributions is sparser, right? Because there's just fewer women. Um, now, in some cases, if there's like way too few women, you just can't get a, a statistically significant result um, but again, we're just, in those cases, we're throwing it out, right? We, because we can't say anything. Um, and then with respect to the algorithm changes, so that's question two. Um, so because of us, you know, trying to be kind to the services, the data was collected over roughly two months for each one. So if there were changes happening, that would be embedded in the data, and there's not a lot I can do about that. Um, I mean, I guess we could take the data and stratify it by when it was collected to see if there's like a systematic difference between month one or month two or week one and week two. Um, if I was looking at LinkedIn, I would be a lot more concerned about that because I, I have the preconceived notion that they're a lot more technically sophisticated. Uh, these companies are not, indeed might be technically sophisticated. Monster and Career Builder are not technically sophisticated. <laughs> I would. I really don't think they're doing a live algorithm updates. <laughs> Hi, uh, another question. 
I wanted to sort of uh, make a follow-up or add on to a previous question that was raised um, over there. Um, considering that systematic inequality is usually due to a process of artificial inflation, so uh, where you have a system that prioritizes certain groups mm -hmm. at the expense of other groups. So when there's a gap now or discrimination, uh, which was caused by artificial inflation, uh, as a way forward, do you think that these ranking systems or these companies should also artificially inflate their results in order to make up for that gap that's you know been caused? Yeah, so I very much agree with that. Um, so in terms of like individual versus group fairness, I am in favor of group fairness. You know, in the in the American sort of parlance, this is affirmative action. Um, so yeah, I mean, that's exactly what you would do. You would take the disadvantaged group and you would inflate them or increase their rank systematically to compensate for this, uh, this social process that systematically depressed them in the past. I, mean, I think that's what people should do. I think that's the goal we should strive for. Um, but I'm just you know, an ivory, ac ivory tower academic, so. <laughs> Um, could you elaborate a bit on that second point and uh, why it is so difficult to increase both uh, individual and group fairness at the same time and what do you picture by some point in between? Yeah, so depending on the base rates of a given attribute in the population, you can show that you can't have both. Um, so let's have a hypothetical example where let's say, I don't know, um, all, I don't know, I'm trying to come up with something that's like not offensive. All people who smoke cigarettes also go to community college, All right? And let's say that you want fairness between smokers and non-smokers. If the base rates of education between smokers and non-smokers are just systematically different, like bipolar, you know, individual fairness will say the non-smokers always go to the bottom because right, they only have community college, everyone else has full college. Right? That's, that's individually fair. But if we say we want group fairness, then the two things should be interleaved. Right? It should be a smoker, non-smoker, smoker, non-smoker, smoker, non-smoker. Non and that's incompatible with the, but I'm trying to sort based on education. So if you have this kind of situation where the, just the base rates in the population diverge, you can't have both. So that gives you, sort of a knob, right? We can say we want individual, we can say we want fair, or it can be somewhere in between. And what that means is sort of unclear, because now it's not, it's not obvious what you're optimizing for. You know, is it I want to be group fair within kind of some threshold, let's say like the disparate impact threshold in the law, and then within that kind of error range, I can then uh, resort people by individual fairness, or is it something else entirely, like I'm optimizing for exper user experience, like to match their expectations? It's unclear. It's, that's an ill-defined point in the space. Hi, my name's Martin. Um, on, a, on at least three occasions that I can recall off the top of my head, I attended sort of public, I don't know, I'm a member of the public, uh, sessions here at a couple of different Harvard institutions, colleges, or, and there were three references to a book uh, by the title of Weapons of Math Destruction. I later attended a talk by the author of the book, uh, actually at the Microsoft Nerd Center while he stepped out, and during her talk, she referred to her publisher's directions, guy, uh, or you might say marching orders, <laughs> were that there should be blood on every page. <laughs> One of the sessions that I attended, a, what I believe a Harvard undergraduate, his reference to the book was that it is required reading at Harvard. <laughs> um, so I guess you see where I'm going with this. I, I, the, you earlier in answer to one of the questions, I think I heard you to say with a little bit of sort of humility that we're just not there yet. We maybe just don't know everything about this technology and you know how to solve necessarily every problem, every question. Uh, but I would suggest that the author of Weapons of Math Destruction 
wrote a book that you might come away from that book sort of feeling like, you know what, if we can just get these amoral engineers a little bit of morals, we'll solve everything. So as, as an educator, I can tell you there are plenty of amoral engineers coming out of our institutions who could absolutely use some ethics training, uh, which is something I'm working on on my sabbatical, actually. Um, but yeah, I mean, your, your characterization of weapons of math destruction, um, it's, it's similar to how I feel about um, Black Box Society by like Frank Pascal. I mean, it's, it's very much gloom and doom, um, but, I, but I see the a need for that, right? There's kind of an Overton window of the debate around technology and society, right? And I, I think we need people on one end really pushing for these are the terrible things that could happen. Um, if we're talking about you know, police adopting uh, software to uh, you know, determine bail and do predictive policing, I mean, the, the social consequences are so pernicious. I feel like somebody has to get out in front of that. Right? Even if the worst case doesn't happen, just elucidating that like, the worst case could happen, um, I think that's really important, right? That serves a really important function. Um, so in terms of you know, making weapons of math destruction required reading, I think it's important. You know, even if it is a little hyperbolic, just to say like these terrible things could happen, right? And you're gonna go out in the world and build systems and use data and collect data, right? You have to have this on the back of your mind. I think that that serves an incredibly important function. Um, Kathy's is probably the best, in my opinion. I mean, there, there's a lot now. Um, you know, Meredith Whitaker has one, um, Sophia Noble. Um, I mean, there's, there's a bunch, and they, they all have you know, slightly different angles, and I think they're all valuable. Um, but I would say Kathy was kind of there first, um, and I like her book a lot. <laughs> I think we have time for one last question, if there's one last burning question. If not, may I, I'll ask a question, which is um, the methodology that you've talked about, about auditing systems, I, th I think is really interesting applied in this particular context. But if you were to abstract it to other areas, which you have done, how, how should we think about auditing algorithms as a research community? And what, what do you think people should be doing more of in terms of interrogating these types of black box systems and ways that we can do that from being outside the companies? Yeah, so there's a bunch of things. Um, you know, right now, the auditing community is kind of small. It's very academic. And our tools are, are garbage, frankly. Right? We build these things on the fly. Um, I think there needs to be a more sustained effort across academia and investigative journalists um, foundations to, to build auditing infrastructure, and part of that has to be enfranchising people. Um, it can't just be me, you know, tinkering with JavaScript and my students. Um, giving people tools that they can record data, donate data, see the results of, of data. You know, give them little knobs to tune where it's like, here's the newsfeed algorithm yesterday, and here's it today, right? What are the differences? Do you care about those differences? Um, I think that's really important. Um, the, the complexity of the systems and the speed at which the systems change has to be matched by an equivalent auditing infrastructure. And building that's gonna be a monumental effort. Um, the other reason that needs to happen is eventually, um, you know, NSF support for auditing will, will run out. You know, right now, there's like new science here. How do you measure things? But eventually, that, that's not gonna sustain the work. Right? It has to be sustained from outside. Um, there's also a lot that has to be done in the policy realm. You know, com companies don't love this, uh, and there's potential legal implications to this, um, which is, is discouraging in any number of ways. So normalizing this as a practice, right, the way that security and white hat hacking have been more or less normalized, I think that's really important. Um, so, you know, so whether that's just changing corporate culture, changing policy, changing law, you know, I, I think there's, there's potential remedies in all these realms. Great, so thank you once again, Christo. Thank you.